Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to this very special episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. I give a talk on Dr. GPCR and the ecosystem on October 12th, 2020, at the third earnest meeting. The title of my talk was Beyond the Lab. Before diving into this episode, I wanted to say thank you to the earnest meeting organizers for the invitation, with special thanks to Dr. Martha Sommer, Dr. Alexander Hauser, and Louise Wagner. For more information about the Ernest Network, please visit ernest-gpcr.eu. That is ernest-gpcr.eu. If you'd like to know more about us, please visit drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. We also have a monthly newsletter to which you can subscribe if you haven't done so yet at drgpcr.com slash newsletter. If you'd like to sponsor us, please visit drgpcr.com slash sponsors or email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Did you know that we also have a Dr. GPCR YouTube channel? If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe today. You can watch my presentation as well as all of our podcast episodes there as well. So I'm just going to highlight that uh, what you see right now on the screen should be uh, a survey. So if you could go to the website, the link should also be in the chat. Um, that would be great if you could fill out that form. So hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Hauser from the Early Career Committee team, and I'm going to chair this session. I'm very excited to welcome Yamina Bechicha, the founder of the Ecosystem and podcast, Dr. GPCR. I'm a big fan of podcasts myself, so I was delighted to see a new GPCR podcast, which I've been following since the first episode. As uh, Yamina is going to walk us through her career and her process to establish Dr. GPCR, I'm not going to take anything away of that. Just, last, just one last thing, if you have any questions to Yamina, please put them in the general chat or directly to me, and I will do my best to have them addressed after her presentation. So please, Jamina, the, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Now, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. To me, it's morning. I am in Boston. I am sharing my screen. Alex, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, all right. So let me uh, go full screen. So before I start, I wanted to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the kind words, Alex. Uh, welcome to my studio. Actually, this is where I usually record a podcast episodes. This is actually my closet. Um, some podcast episodes I also recorded in my car, as you will see uh, in the next episode that will be released soon with Dr. Uh, Brian Roth. So um, today I am going to talk to you about Dr. GPCR, but uh, here is the preview and the overview of my presentation. I have three main sections. Uh, section number one, I am going to talk to you a little bit about geography and history. I will run you through some of the highlights or some of the moments uh, that determined my, my career as a scientist. So I call this pre-Dr. GPCR. And then I will walk you through Dr. GPCR, the Dr. GPCR ecosystem, and the programs that we've established to help uh, bring under the same umbrella the whole community working on GPCRs with the goal to um, better understand GPCR biology and hopefully move forward uh, drugging GPCRs uh, in the clinic. So a little bit of history and geography. I was born in a city called Oradia, which is uh, at the border between Hungary and Romania on the Romanian side. Then uh, my family and I moved to Algiers, where we spent over a decade then moved back to, to Romania before moving to Montreal, Canada. And that's where I started my university studies at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Montreal in 2000. And that was the moment where I got first exposed to, to uh, GPCRs. And I'll go more into details with, with, uh, with these stops. But my fascination with GPCRs, working three months in, as a summer intern in the lab during my undergrad, led me to a master's and a PhD also in biochemistry at the University of Montreal in the same lab where I was able to contribute to eight peer reviewed published papers. I was able to contribute also to uh, R&D funding up to 1.6 million Canadian dollars 
and I had the opportunity to collaborate, but also to mentor students and postdocs in the lab. And not having had enough of working in the lab and working on GPCRs, I decided to go for a postdoc uh, training at the Rockefeller University in New York City. And I worked in Tom Sackmar's lab, where I was able to publish four peer-reviewed papers. I worked in an industry collaboration. So our lab had established a collaboration with the company and we were able to uh, obtain $400,000 in R&D funding. And I had the opportunity to use my skills that I brought on from Montreal to establish novel technologies in the lab, but also mentor students and postdocs. Then um, from New York City, I moved to Maryland to Bethesda, where I worked as a research fellow uh, at the National Institutes of Health, at the National Institutes of Allergy and Immunology, ah. Allergy, <laughs> allergies and infectious diseases in the lab of B cell molecular immunology. It's a, hand, it's, it's a mouthful uh, where I continued working on GPCRs, mainly on, on one type of, of GPCRs, which I'll get back to later. But I also learned new techniques and I was very uh, intrigued by the CRISPR knockout cell line technology, which I was able to generate two CRISPR knockout cell lines. And then what you would call going to the dark side, I started working at a biotech company in Boston where I'd still located. So the company um, is called Generate Biomedicines, formerly called the L56 for Venture Lab 56, where I used my experience working on GPCRs and my scientific knowledge to further um, work on a family of GPCRs. And the company focused on using AI and machine learning to explore the protein space. And I'm going to get back to, uh, to this a little bit later. And then COVID hit and it was a blessing in disguise. And um, in March 2020, this year, I decided that I wanted to do something different. And I founded Dr. GPCR. And within Dr. GPCR, various programs to help scientists working on in the field connect. So one of these programs is my podcast that Alex also had talked about. So, so far, we, uh, I recorded 30 podcast episodes with various, um, various guests. We released 13 episodes. So far, we have over 2,000 listeners for, this ep for, for the podcast. Uh, we also have a newsletter, a monthly newsletter that goes out to 600 recipients. Many, many Twitter followers, LinkedIn and Facebook followers, and I'll, I want to thank them for that. And then I think the highlight of Dr. GPCR for this year was organizing the Dr. GPCR Summit with 30 phenomenal various talks and 400 registrants for the summit. So now I'm gonna take you uh, through snippets of, of these different stops that I had through my career, and I'm going to highlight um, some, some of the lessons that I learned during that time. So my first contact with GPCR has happened at the University of Montreal at the Department of Biochemistry. And it was a class of, uh, of about signaling pathways and Dr. Michel Bouvier <clears throat> was teaching the class. I don't specifically remember what he was talking about. I was just fascinated by how many signaling pathways could be um, activated when, you, when a receptor was binding its, its ligand. So <clears throat> during this training, uh, during this, this degree, undergraduate degree, there was an opportunity to spend a summer in a research lab. And, um, out of out of a uh, disappointing news that Michel didn't couldn't have me work in his lab, he had offered the position to one of my best colleagues and good friends. He introduced me to someone named Nicolas Eveker, who uh, became actually my mentor at the uh, Saint Justine Hospital Research Center. And Nicolas at the time had opened his lab, so when I entered the lab for an interview, there was no equipment. There were only bills everywhere on every desk and every bench. So I was the first student in the lab and Nicolas was working on chemokines and chemokine receptors. And as soon as I heard about the chemokines and chemokine receptor system, I thought it was, it was a very interesting and very cool system to work about, uh, work on. So chemokines are small proteins that bind, bind chemokine receptors. And one of the uh, problems that we were working on is trying to understand the confirmation and function relationships between chemokines and chemokine receptors. So as many of you know, there is about 20 chemokine receptors and there is about 50 plus chemokines that exist. And one of the problems in the field was that uh, a lot of, for a long time, people were thinking that the chemokines were, it was a redundant system, 
meaning that more than one chemokine could bind more than one receptor. And as you have must, you must have guessed by now, uh, my favorite chemokine or my favorite GPCR family is chemokine receptors. So in short, I don't want to uh, talk too much about science, but chemokines help cells to get oriented in the organism and they're involved in immune diseases, for example, but they're also involved in normal processes such as embryogenesis, uh, axon guidance and maturation. And the way I, the technology that I used to study chemokine receptor structure or confirmation function relationships was by uh, spending some time in Michel Bouvier's lab with whom we collaborated extensively and learn bioluminescence resonance energy transfer techniques. So with this technique, I was able to measure protein-protein interaction, but also measure conformational changes uh, in response to chemokines binding the receptor. So um, after my undergraduate degree and spending the summer in Nikolaus's lab, I decided to move forward and do a master's in the same lab uh, at the hospital, uh, at St. Justine Hospital. And, uh, this is the highlighted publication that came out of those almost three years worth of effort. And it was an accelerated publication in JBC, of which I'm very proud. And um, what I learned from this is that I can generate side-directed single mutations without actually using a PCR. Uh, we were very old school at the time. Um, what I also learned is that if you have a goal, you can reach it with whatever materials you have in the lab. There was one time that I remember is that we didn't have ATP in the lab to, uh, to do some molecular biology experiments. <clears throat> and we just went ahead and found a buffer that had the right amount of ATP and it still worked. Um, the other thing I learned during my master's is that collaboration in science and in the field is essential. Um, we worked with uh, Dr. Françoise Bachelery in Paris to, who helped us characterize the mutants of, of CXCR4 and measure the GL5 activation of these mutants. And the last thing that I wanna highlight from, from my time as a master's student is that most things happen for a reason. The behind the story, uh, the, the story behind, behind the sentence is that at the University of Montreal back in the day, if you wanted to go from undergraduate to a PhD and skip the master's, you needed to have, the, the, you needed to have high grades, which I didn't have. That's why I started a master's. And even with my master classes, I didn't have the correct grades. And I felt very disappointed. But what I realized over time is that I needed that time and writing a master's thesis to be ready and prepared to move towards uh, a PhD. So it was a blessing in disguise. And uh, what I want to say about this is that sometimes in life, things happen, you feel disappointed. But it, these things happen for a reason. And you need to learn something new in order to, to move forward which is exactly what happened. So uh, still in Nikolaus's lab, I realized I love teaching. So Nikolaus offered me the PhD position in the lab. Uh, I got fellowships and I also got the opportunity to teach. And I worked on various projects. And one of these projects was uh, that led to this publication in Molecular Pharmacology in 2011, where um, <clears throat> we characterized uh, the natural chemokines binding chemokine receptor CCR2B and I just put in here on the right side of the screen some highlights and using BRET technology, using two conformational and two functional readouts, we were able to rank the efficacy, um, rank these chemokines by efficacy in all of these assays. And what I learned from uh, this experience and, and be doing a PhD is that uh, for the first time I was able to think on my own as a scientist. This is the first project where I felt like I was I was the lead on the project. I needed help. So as I mentioned in the first, uh, in, in my master's slide, we went out and collaborated with external collaborators, but this time I identified a need for collaborating within, uh, within the group. So this paper is only, it's Nikolaus's lab. We were all on the paper because we all put, put, put our heads together, worked together and, and got it done. And at this point um, I had, I hadn't had enough working in the lab. And the reason I'm saying this is that this doesn't happen very often, but this was the highlight of, of, of papers because we did get two beautiful reviews. So uh, let me actually move you, Alex, because I can't really see it. I collated all the both reviews that came back for the paper, but I highlighted, and I'm not gonna read all of it, but um, this doesn't happen very often, especially uh, 
as a PhD, but reviewer number one said, my only criticism for this excellent manuscript is that I could not find a legend for the table. Reviewer two uh, said, this is a very interesting paper that touches on how functional selectivity may be employed by a redundant system like the chemokine system. I have no substantive criticism of the work and applaud the authors for de delving into this area. So this was a really highlight moment in my career. This is that, this is the moment when I said, well, you know what, I, I think I'm pretty good at pipetting and I'm pretty good at thinking scientifically. So let's, let's move on and, and do a postdoc. And I landed in what I call the center of the world, which is Manhattan. And I worked as a postdoc in Dr. Tom Sackmar's lab at the Rockefeller University. And uh, not only it was a dream come true living in New York, but also the other dream I had is to live as closely as possible to the lab. And it did happen. Uh, the distance or the, the distance in time between my apartment and the lab was literally five minutes. And I want to share the view out of, out of my apartment on, on, on a day after some, some rain. And you can see the rainbow as well. And this is the Queensboro Bridge. At the other end of the Queensboro Bridge, you have Queens. So um, it was a magical five years where I got to collaborate, to work with many people from different other labs. But the highlight uh, of this, of these five years spent in Tom's lab came out of a question that Tom has asked me. So initially when I went to Tom's lab, I had the luxury to choose a project that I wanted to work on. And I wanted to work on the heterodimerization of CXCR3 and another chemokine receptor, which is an atypical chemokine receptor called CXCR7. And then through a conversation with Tom, he asked me, well, how come, how come we have three splice variants of CXCR3? So as I mentioned in the beginning, so chemo, the chemokine system has been thought to be redundant for a long time, which actually is not true. We have a lot of evidence showing that the chemokine system is not redundant and that each pair of chemokine and chemokine receptor actually activate a specific signaling pathway to lead to a specific signaling, uh, to lead a, a physiological event. But then to add a layer of complexity to the system came out, this, came out the discovery of alternative splice variants of chemokine receptors. So this chemokine receptor, CXCR3, uh, is expressed in immune cells and uh, it has three different alternative splice variants. So using uh, the previous technologies that I had learned uh, in Nicolaus's lab during my master's and PhD, and also I um, developed novel technologies to measure uh, signaling of, of GPCRs, I was able to show that the ligands actually selectively activate different signaling pathways. And the reviews, just to get back to the reviews from, from my PhD, the reviews for this paper were not as, as stellar, but still, I, I thought it was a great accomplishment. It was my first two author paper, and it was the first two author paper in Tom's lab for the past 20 years. And I obviously contributed to, to other, other collaborations. And one highlight is that the technologies that we used in this paper were then applied to other papers and other projects we worked on in the lab. So it was, it was a double win, publishing this paper, better understanding how uh, the splice variants of CXCR3 get activated, but also we could take those uh, technologies and apply them to various other projects. So before I move on to the next steps, uh, this is just a very short list of, of acknowledgement for to all of those people who helped uh, work, help me and work to get with, with, with whom we worked together to, to get that work out. It is definitely not a complete list, but um, I wanted to show you this because I wanted to highlight the fact that all of the work that was published that I worked on was thanks to collaborations. And without these collaborators, without these thought leaders with whom you know, we exchanged ideas and they read the manuscript and there was a lot of back and forth we would have not um, been able to publish uh, all, all those papers. And then uh, after my time in, in Tom's lab, I, as I said, moved <clears throat> into, uh, into the B cell molecular immunology lab at NIH. And this is a picture of the clinical center of NIH in Maryland, Bethesda. And this was a, a time of reflection. So at this moment, I was at a point in my career where I realized, well, I can pipette. I can think scientifically, I can write a paper, I can publish, but I felt a need for, for speed. So I was, as you realize, the th 
the past three slides were focused very much on science. I spent a lot of time in the lab, really focusing deep diving in one, to one, on one specific problem. And getting to NIH, I realized that I would have, I, I'm more interested at, the, at this point to look at the 30,000 feet view of a problem or of, of a field, which is the field of GPCRs. And I felt that doing the experiments in the lab were not as fulfilling, it wasn't fast enough, and I wasn't contributing to, to the field to the full extent of, of my abilities and my capacities. So this is when at NIH, I decided that I wanted to go what you'd call the dark side, which I don't think it's a dark side, but I, while working in the lab, I took a lot of time to think about moving into industry, perfecting my LinkedIn profile, making sure that my 10 page res CV became a two-page resume that was relevant to different job descriptions. And luckily, I was hired as a senior scientist uh, at a biotech company here in Boston. And this is a beautiful, a beautiful picture of Boston. The company was at, is actually in, in Cambridge. Um, and the company uses AI and machine learning, mainly machine learning, to explore the protein space and to come up with novel protein therapeutics. And one of the projects that the company was interested in is a class B GPCR peptide binding project on which I worked. And it was, it was a great experience, but still, I was still working in the lab, micro-focusing on one specific project, and I was missing that 30,000 feet view. Well, again, a blessing in disguise with COVID coming on, um, my position became redundant. So for the first time after almost 20 years working in the lab and working you know, five to seven days a week, uh, I woke up one morning and didn't have anywhere to go. So um, to be honest, I felt a little bit disappointed, a little bit lost. Oh, hold on. I actually forgot to show you the next slide. A um, little bit disappointed, a little bit lost. But then I, uh, I thought about this figure uh, for <clears throat> that Alex actually uh, published in 2017. And um, so in red, you have the GPCR targets that are established. In green, you have the GPCR targets that are in, well, were at the time in clinical trials, but then I couldn't get out of my head the other GPCRs that are here in this list or in this diagram that were no, nowhere near being looked at in, in the clinic or in the context of diseases. So you have uh, 400 non-olfactory GPCRs, only about 166 of them are being targeted and studied for, for clinical applications but you have 200 plus, 250 plus receptors that are not um, well characterized enough and are not uh, considered for, for, any, for the treatment of any diseases. And out of this image came the idea of founding Dr. GPCR. And I am going to switch over to Chrome. Um, Alex, thumbs up. Can you, see, can you still see my screen or do I need to... Uh, Okay. Oh, uh, oh right, right, wait, wait. We can still see the presentation. I think you, you may okay. want to switch your browser yes. to... Yes, so I'm going screen. to stop sharing and I'm going to switch to my Google Chrome tab. And so out of, out of this disappointment of not having where to go, can you see it now? Okay, great. Yes. Um, I was trying to find a way to think about how I can contribute to the field without working in the lab, pipetting, and also having this 30,000 feet view of, of, the, uh, of the field. Uh, I'm sure a lot of PhD students and postdocs can relate to it. You're working in the lab so many hours, you're really focused on your project, but uh, not all of us, at least I didn't have the time to read papers uh, you know, at large and to read widely and to have that inspiration that might help my project. So this is where the idea of Dr. GPCR came and the idea of the Dr. GPCR, of putting together the Dr. GPCR ecosystem. And what is it all about is that it's an, a, the dynamic interaction between all of us working on GPCRs towards exploiting GPCR drug ability, independently on where you're working, whether you're working in academia or you're working in industry, be it biotech or pharma. I think we all, as GPCR, um, GPCR evangelists, we kind of share this desire to, to learn more about not only our receptors, but also to gather as much information as possible about GPCR biology at large. So having these outlets to connect, share, grow, and hopefully form trusting, excuse me, trusting partnerships 
I, I thought it would be a good idea and let's just, I, I figured let's just test it and see. So here on the left side of the screen, you see all the different programs that are included in the ecosystem. And I wanna spend some time on highlighting some of the, the programs on which uh, I decided to focus on. So number one is the Dr. GPCR podcast that Alex also mentioned. And initially before the ecosystem, the first idea we had was the podcast. And the idea of the podcast came out of, of this need to connect and to talk to people. And the, the podcast is actually a set of informational interviews and they're kind of informal as well, where uh, I talk to GPCR experts and uh, the goal is to share their scientific discoveries, share also the behind the, the, behind the scenes stories of, of these discoveries and of the scientists' careers. Uh, a very interesting thing, and it's a premiere here, the next podcast episode that is coming out this, later this week is with Dr. Brian Roth from UNC Chapel Hill. And believe it or not, uh, Brian throughout his career was told so many times that he should quit science. And thank God he did not quit science. So uh, that, that's a story, that, this kind of story that I like to share in the podcast. I wanna also provide researchers an unexplored outlet to share uh, more about their science. Uh, before starting the podcast, I did a little research. There are no other GPCR focused podcasts and there are not a many scientific science focused podcasts out there. And ultimately the goal is to inspire, um, you know, early career scientists to work in the field. Uh, you can listen to the podcast anywhere where you listen to podcasts. For more information about the different um, guests we had, just visit drgpcr.com slash podcast. And um, hopefully, hopefully you'll enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoy talking to, uh, to our guests. All right. So after the podcast, uh, the other thought, the other need I was trying to fill is my need to learn more about what happens in the field. And this is where the idea of the monthly newsletter came out of. So um, as I mentioned, I never really had enough time in the lab or not even the mental bandwidth to just sit down and kind of explore what happened in the field, who works on what, what are the advances on, on in the GPC, in understanding GPCR biology. So the newsletter actually comes out once a month. And this newsletter uh, is in collaboration with two wonderful Dr. GPCR interns, which I'm going to tell who I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later. And it's a collection of all the papers that were published in the past month. We have some industry news. We have news about conferences, including the uh, Ernest conference that's going on in the next three days. And also any highlights in the field, uh, for example, uh, you know, grants uh, that were awarded to scientists, a project that they talk about. And uh, the whole idea is for you to be informed of what happened in the field you can visit drgpcr.com slash newsletter and then subscribe to the monthly newsletter and then you'll get it uh, in your inbox, uh, usually between the first and the 10th uh, of the month. All right, so, and then the highlight of, of this year, I think uh, it was a very successful Dr. GPCR summit and it was a very different type of online meeting. It was a virtual meeting where we had most of our talks being pre-recorded. And I know it's not the same thing as meeting in person, but it's a COVID year. We have to do with what we have. And um, these were pre-recorded talks open to everyone working in the field, not necessarily only principal investigators. We had PhD students. We had uh, postdocs presenting their work. We even had someone uh, from industry present their work. And we were able to get rid of um, um, you know, barriers where you, you can have as many presentations as you want, but also we got rid of time barriers. So whether you're in Australia or in India or in North America, from the comfort of your home, you could watch these pre-recorded talks. And one interesting thing, I'm going to try and click on the next tab here. This is the program that we had this year. We had over 30 talks, 400 registrants, and um, you can actually go back. Some of these speakers, two thirds of the speakers allowed us to keep their talks. So you can go and watch them anytime by visiting drgpcr.com slash summit 2020 schedule. Or we also have a YouTube channel where all of these talks are available. So whenever, you know, you're cooking in the kitchen or, you know, you're cleaning, you can listen to the talks, you can look at the, uh, at the screen and see how phenomenally uh, diverse the, the summit was. 
and how many uh, great presentations we had. And I want to take a moment to thank the presenters who uh, submitted a three minute pre recorded abstract and they submitted their talks. I think it was a fantastic um, summit, and we're already looking forward for the 2021 summit. And then I have two more tabs to show you. So I say I, but actually I am not the only one working in the team. So this is me. We have Attila, who's our brainstorm officer, who's also actually my husband. And then we have Rosa, who has been our sound engineer for, for the podcast. We have also Shivani Sajdev, who is one of our interns. And um, I, it's not on here, but we have Jin Chong also, who is also one of our um, Dr. GPCR interns. And Shivani and Jin are uh, to thank for the phenomenal collection of papers that we send out in our newsletter. But we also work together on the podcast, um, and they help 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 with every program that we have at Dr. GPCR. This is also an invitation to any of you who might be interested in joining the team. Just shoot me an email at hello at drgpcr.com. There is always so much more to do. Um, these are just the snippets of some of the programs that we're working on, but hopefully we want to expand and uh, and you know make it more um, more. Um, I'm looking for the word. It's Monday and it's the morning here in Boston. Uh, a more, uh, a better experience and hopefully we can, we can expand the ecosystem. So if you'd like to join our team to work with us, just, uh, you know, shoot us an email. And then last but not least, this Dr. GPCR uh, programs would have not been the same without the, our sponsors. We have some sponsors and I'm putting it out there. We're looking for more sponsors to help us work full time on, on Dr. GPCR and hopefully bring more to the community and more to understanding GPCR biology and um, moving forward GPCR drug ability. So uh, this is our sponsors page, just visit it. You can also help the Dr. GPCR ecosystem with your donations. It is not mandatory, we're still continuing during, during doing our work, but this would allow us hopefully uh, at some point to make Dr. GPCR a nonprofit organization so that we can work on in the field and contribute to the field um, you know beyond the lab out of the lab and, and still uh, have an impact on the field and with this uh, i wanted to thank you for your attention and i'm ready to take your questions great yamina thank you so much that was uh, really a tour de force through your through your uh, career and um, uh, it must have been a tremendous learning experience uh, i mean now going going this path as, as the first with the uh, GPCR podcast. Um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on uh, the, the pod podcast releases to come. Uh, how many podcasts have you already recorded and uh, what can we expect in the coming months? Yeah, yes, so happy to do that. Uh, um, if I had to choose between all the programs uh, in the Dr. GPCR ecosystem, I think the podcast is one of my favorites. I love to talk to people and I think conducting these interviews, it just, it just makes my day and I'm happy that people actually like it. So we've, I've recorded over 30 podcasts, um, actually 32 or 35 and I have more recordings coming up and um, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a second and I'm going to share some of the next guests the names of some of the next guests that are going to come on the podcast and we'll be releasing it. But we have enough episodes to release one podcast episode once a week or maybe once every 10 days, depending on, on, on actually how much time I have to work on it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, of the talk, this is where I record my podcast, The Closet, the, the famous podcast studio. And um, I'm really, really excited to, to you know, have these guests, to talk to these people. And I don't know if I mentioned it when I talked about the podcast, but uh, we're opening up the floor to PhDs and postdocs as well to come on the podcast. I want to highlight um, my first PhD student podcast that I did with um, Eleonora, Eleonora Comeo from Nottingham. We had a phenomenal discussion. I think there is a value to talk to GPCR scientists who are established, but there is also a value to talk to postdocs and PhD students so that not only we can talk about their science, but also talk about, you know, balancing life and, and the lab. And as you mentioned, Alex, offline before we started, back in the day, 
you and I, and I think a lot of us spent a lot of time in the lab and we were there at almost any, any time of, of the day or of the night. But with time, we've learned to, uh, to better organize our, our time and be more efficient in the lab. And I think having those discussions uh, can be really, really, really useful. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, certainly. So I really look forward to the coming, the coming podcast. Uh, there's, yes. a, the, there's a question from uh, Antonella, which, yes. uh, who you've also had on your podcast already. Yes. Uh, what about the next Dr. GPCR Summit? Do you plan the same format? Um, so what, what's going to happen with the doc next Dr. GPCR Summit uh, is that I will send out a um, survey to all the registrants and we're going to collect the information and see what people think thought about the uh, the format so i had a lot of positive feedback about the format in an ideal world i'd like to kind of have a, a double type of summit if this whole COVID situation resolves and have kind of an in-person and also at the same time an online summit um, the advantage of having a summit in person or having a conference in person is having that human contact with i think with, with COVID, we all um, crave. But at the same time, being able to go to a conference and participate at a conference from the comfort of your home and not having to travel, I think it has also the, its advantages. So um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens, but we're already planning next year's summit. That's great. That's great. Um, there's another question from uh, David Glorium. So Dr. GPCI will have a huge impact, and I agree. Great to see that our 2017 drug study could be, uh, could, could be inspired, and I hope to interlink with GPCRDP soon. Could you say a bit more about the long-term plans and visions? And I want to second also, do you have an uh, approach like funding bodies to um, have like a long-term sustainable uh, sort of uh, security, let's say, uh, to, to, to continue Dr. GPCR? So uh, just to make sure, two, there's, this is one question and two. One is what are, what are the plans for Dr. GPCR? And the second question is about, is about funding and, and long-term survival of this project, starting out of a, of a bad situation oh, in, in, in a very odd year. So long-term, um, we already actually have, we already have some plans and I can't talk too much about it, but the way I, uh, we, we see Dr. GPCR is having, um, having this, this umbrella where we can all get together and uh, exchange not only ideas, but also have, have this, this space where we can collaborate, we can help each other. Um, one example that comes to mind is that you're in the lab, and it's a very simple example, you're in the lab, you're working on a project and uh, you have a question and no one around you can give you that answer. And then you post it online or you try to Google it and it just doesn't come up. So having a safe space where all of us in the GPCR field can go and can help each other, I think it's something that we really wanna work towards. Um, and it is not restricted to only academics, but also having this ability to you know, come up with an idea and then have the possibility to collaborate with biotech and biopharma in order to, to speed up things. I think after a while, especially when, you, when you're a student, at least when I was a student and a trainee, the goal was to learn how to think, how to pipette and how to do things. But if you want to advance the field and you want to, you know, drug GBCR is better, the point is not to show that you can pipette, but the point is to get to that result. And having a safe space, a space that is, um, that has members that are vetted who can really work put their heads together and work together that that's our goal with with dr gpcr when it comes to to funding um as i mentioned we're actually looking uh for for sponsors we're also looking for funding for us to focus full time on on this project i think it has um the i think it has noble goals um as i mentioned to you alex i think we had this discussion or maybe it was with david i am not sure I can't remember, but the goal is, 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 to, is to be able to do it full time and at the same time have a much larger and much imp more important uh, impact in the field without having to think about, about the funding. That's great. 
Yeah, maybe you should uh, try approach some of the, um, I mean, I don't know in the US, but uh, there might be some funding organizations uh, that uh, you could actually talk to uh, that could independently um, sponsor Dr. GPCR. Yes, uh, yes. Similarly, as they sponsor research projects. Exactly. So uh, I mean, there are now more, there is now more focus on outreach in general. So maybe you could even hook on to existing applications for like large center grants to, to do the, sort of the outreach as part of that center and then take some of that funding overhead uh, to Dr. GPCR in more general. That would be fantastic. To be honest, uh, we've been focused on on putting out great content, on establishing ourselves, on making sure that people actually wait for that episode, podcast episode, for example. And I think now we're at a point where we really do want to take it to the next level and, and go for that funding. And I, that's why I put it out there. We do have sponsor, pa sponsor packages where you could sponsor a podcast, you could sponsor a newsletter, but also you could sponsor Dr. GPCR in general. And we're definitely looking for that support from the community because we want to work for the community. Fantastic. There's another comment from uh, Isabel. Um, she says, great initiative and talk. Podcast episodes are out of invitations. People that volunteer or both in case of many candidates for the episodes, how do you choose? Um, so uh, the podcast episode, the first podcast episodes were more of an experiment. So what happened is that I first chose 20 people uh, in the field were, I'd say, pretty well established. Some people I knew their work and some people I knew personally. And I sent out an email and I said, well, actually, this is what I want to do. Would you be interested? And it was kind of a, a marketing exper experiment that I had launched out. And um, it was a very successful one because out of the 20 emails, I think we had a 90% response rate or 95% response rate, and 75% of those people said, well, yes, of course, we want to do this. And those are the people I call early adopters. And we did record these podcast episodes, and we put a couple of, out, couple of them out. I was very touched by someone who had reached out and said, you know, the podcast saved my life because we went into lockdown and I had no contact with, with science anymore. And that was a very humbling uh, review. So right now, uh, there are invitations that go out to podcast guests, but on the drgpcr.com slash podcast, there is a guest form that anyone is uh, welcome to fill out. It's going to end up in my inbox and I will respond. Uh, not, not very fast, I have to admit. The list, the list right now is, is pretty long, but I will definitely respond. You can suggest yourself as a guest or suggest someone else. And I want to applaud uh, some of the PhDs and postdocs who reached out and suggested phenomenal guests, and I will reach out to everyone. Um, and you just need to answer those questions, and um, you'll, you'll get on the podcast. The goal with the podcast, my dream, is to actually interview everyone in the field. Which hopefully, we'll create an endless number of podcast episodes. That's fantastic. Great. And of course, it's an ever-growing field, so there's going to be uh, many, many talks and podcasts to listen Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on how do you actually prepare for such an interview? I mean, of course, you've ha had a tremendous background in GPCR research yourself, but uh, obviously there are areas that you may not be as familiar with. So how yeah. do you actually prepare for an interview? And, and maybe also how, um, how can the person you interview prepare for, for such, an, yeah, such, such a podcast episode? Because also... You know, for, for the average scientist, that's, that's not a normal way to present uh, yeah. themselves or their research. It is. So, um, once, one, so the way, I'll give you kind of a chronological, um, you know, if, the way the events happen chronologically. So, um, you're going to be a guest on the podcast. We're going to find a date. You're going to get a calendar invite and the Zoom link. And um, at least two to three weeks before the podcast, I will share the questions that I plan on asking. Uh, these are pretty much general questions or high level questions and guests are welcome to modify them or tell me that they don't wanna delve into one area and then we can change them. The whole point of the podcast is to tell a story about the science that this, the guest is working on and about the guest um, himself or herself. And so that guests get these questions 
and some some you know read the questions and prepare on their own others fill out and respond in into the document to, to those questions depending on the comfort level of of the speaker um, and that's that's how guests actually prepare for the podcast and usually uh, it takes about an hour total to record we meet on zoom we you know I'll run through some housekeeping things, for example, turning off your phone and turning off, off your, your email alerts. And then we go through the questions and sometimes we get through the questions and sometimes we just go into a completely different direction, which I really like because it makes the podcast episode pretty unique. Um, and, and this way, this is how we usually, we usually record and, and go through these questions. On my end, the way I prepare is uh, I usually read a couple of papers, at least the abstracts of a couple of papers of, of, the, uh, of the guest and, and try to, um, you know, do a bunch of Google searches and try to understand what they're working on, uh, what kind of questions and what direction I can take and uh, learn a little bit more about the field, especially if I'm not uh, familiar or that familiar with the field so that I can, I can say something and, and lead the discussion the, the discussion towards towards the direction that I feel like it's it's, it's very important. It's 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 so interesting. You have guests who 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 talk more or have more stories. They have guests who are more to the point. But I think after thirty episodes, I got to a point where I can redirect some of the questions and make it more interesting. And it is definitely an acquired uh, skill. It's definitely not um, uh, something that comes naturally. I remember my first podcast with Paul Insel, and I was so grateful that Paul had so many phenomenal stories because I was very nervous to record that podcast. And it turned out to be a great episode and I learned a lot. Nice, great. Do you maybe want to share some, um, you know, some quirks and glitches that uh, came through recording those 30 episodes? Something uh, <laughs> that, you know, some uh, unexpected ob obstacles and Yes, <laughs> happy to do that. Uh, and after that, I have pulled up the list of the next couple of guests and I'm happy to share a few, few names with you. Um, so in the summertime, I used to record from my car. So I have a, a Prius, a Toyota Prius, which is a tiny car. Well, it's not, it's, it's a Prius V, so it's a larger car, but still sitting in the car in the summertime. Uh, that was, the I think, one of the hardest things is that I had the microphone, I had the computer, and I, the car was parked or is parked even now in front of the gym where there is wi-fi and that was the the, the whole point of of parking the car there so i can record the uh the episode in a quiet environment now that was great in april and may and you know in june but then in the middle of the july it was such it was so warm in the car that at some point i i was still able to follow the discussion but i i was sweating like crazy, but I couldn't open the windows or put on the AC because that would have, um, you know, ended up in uh, in background noise, which was difficult to to get out. And I think that was that that was the most difficult and challenging part in recording the podcast from the car. And then my husband decided to make me a desk in the closet, and we got the uh, the curtains behind me so that we can uh, I can close the door and be still in a closed environment with the, with the AC on. And not die. And interestingly, Brian Roth uh, had mentioned, I recorded the episode with him in the car, and he had mentioned that his first slab was about the size of, of my car, which, which I thought was a really, a really funny thing to say. So um, I am going to share a couple of uh, upcoming episodes with actually a couple up, upcoming guests. Um, so Brian Roth, as I mentioned, we're going to have Dr. Arun Shukla. Dr. Fiona Marshall. Uh, we're going to have also Dr. Aaron Sato from Twist Biopharma at the end of the month. But uh, happy to have talked to Dr. Maria Walter, uh, Carrie Johnson, Dr. Masha Niv, uh, Annette Gilchrist, Debbie Hay. Uh, these are just a few names of, of, of people I spoke to, but I'm already starting to record podcasts for next year in January. And uh, we've had Dr. Ross Chaloha. And we have many, many more guests coming on. As I said, uh, everyone is welcome. Just shoot us an email, submit the guest form. Uh, my email is hello at drgpcr.com. Fantastic. And uh, I don't see any more um, questions, but I want to highlight that there is uh, going to be another session with uh, Yamina, which is going to be on uh, Wednesday, session 
17, where Yamina is going to facilitate a roundtable discussion on AI and GPCR research together with Maria Valdoa, Tuda Oprah, and uh, Thomas Segma. So I'm very much looking forward to, to that. And um, yeah, if there's nothing else, then I would like to thank you again for coming to the uh, earnest meeting and sharing your your career and um, your yeah idea ideas around the GPCR Dr. GPCR ecosystem. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to have been able to present this work and, and talk to you. And uh, as I said, if you, anyone has any questions, just visit us drgpcr.com or just shoot us an email at hello drgpcr dot com and uh, thanks so much Alex for the opportunity and thanks for the organizers for having me. That's great. Thank you so much. Talk to Thank you soon. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this very special episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. I really hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you again to the Ernest Network for the opportunity to talk to them. Thank you to Dr. Alexander Hauser for moderating the session. Also thank you to Attila Forrest, Jun Chong and Shivani Sajdev. Music by Rosa Bershish. If you'd like to sponsor us, please visit drgpcr.com slash sponsors. We truly appreciate your support, which allows us to bring you podcast episodes, newsletters, and so much more. I'm your host, Dr. Yamina Bershish, and until next time, stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>